are our men. The Parker Watch Company and its dealers throughout America dedicate this program to the United States Treasury Department for the sale of war bonds. With Jack Benny as our special guest today, we proudly present another in this series of dramatic programs, These Are Our Men. The fight for total victory. These are our men. Eisenhower, Halsey, Marshall, Arnold, Wainwright, Clark, Patrick, Bradley. Today it's the story of Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz. Our story will begin in a moment, but first, here's a chap who works for the U.S. government seven days a week, one of the Treasury Department's star salesmen, and our special guest today. Yes, you all know him, the one and only Jack Benny. Thanks, folks, and thanks, Jack Costello. You know, folks, I'm here for two reasons today. First, uh, Jack Costello promised to give me a pack of cigarettes. A full pack. Okay, Jack, and I'll keep my promise. But you better take care of them. They're hard to get. You're telling me I'm going to give half of them to a guy who's been trying for three days to get a pack. Who's that? My sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, folks, I'm here for a second reason. To ask you to keep on buying those war bonds. And when you've bought them, keep them. I'll be back later. Right now, let's listen together to the story of another of these great leaders of ours. <laughs> This is one for Rosie. Yes, that's right, Rosie. Surely, ladies and gentlemen, you know who Rosie is. Well, your son's in the Pacific, too. Hi, fellas. Hello, you big, handsome brute from Brooklyn, Kansas City, and all points. <laughs> yes, that's Rosie, folks. Tokyo Rose, the flower of Yokohama Bay, the Lady Haw Haw of Imperial Nippon. The gal with the biggest radio audience west of the Golden Gate. The sponsor's dream. Only her sponsors happen to be the Japanese government. As the boys will tell you, Rosie's crude, but she's funny. <laughs> she's funny just because she is crude. And so they tune her in. And their commanders never object either. Even though each night she attacks MacArthur and Halsey and Nimitz and Kincaid and the rest of our Pacific leaders, here's a typical routine <laughs> featuring Tokyo Rose. Rashning, rashning, rashning. I'm of rationing. All I ever get to eat nowadays is chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I wonder what that game looks like. Quiet, let's listen. All four and five star admirals sitting behind their big, comfortable desks, moving little pins up and down on mats. Why should they get their feet wet? One more pin, and you guys go out and on everyone else. Now it's the Navy's turn. Moving pins, huh? Wonder if she heard about the pin we stuck in Midway. <laughs> yeah, I'm at Gilbert's and Wayne. That's right. Why, for God's sake, give us Admiral a listen. There. Admiral Nimitz, the sailor's five-star skipper. Admiral Nimitz, a fine sailor he is. Oh, yes, he can man anything that floats. Most of the time, but when the breezes blow, he generally goes below. He's never, never sick at sea. Well, hardly ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said earlier, Tokyo Rose, this one's for you. 
This show goes overseas, so I hope you'll hear it. Why? Well, frankly, Rosie, we're going to do a little bragging about this chap Nimitz. And a little admitting, too. You see, Rosie, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, the guy you pick on so often, is, well, he's really a very human chap. I know that you, respecting sport as you do, would think a lot more of him if I could tell you that he's a fire-eating, chest-thumping war dog. But he isn't, Rosie. He just isn't. I wish I could tell you, Rosie, that when he first saw Pearl Harbor after your gang's treachery, I wish I could tell you that he stomped and cussed and swore in righteous wrath, but he didn't, Rosie. He, he didn't. He just looked westward toward your home island and said softly and solemnly, I have assumed a great responsibility and obligation, which I shall do my utmost to discharge. Yes, that's just about all he said, Rosie. Simple words, aren't they? But do you detect a threat behind those simple words, Rosie? You detect a promise of a reckoning that is to come? I do. Oh, I wish I could paint a great picture for you, Rosie. A picture of a long line of naval heroes and the ancestry of this Chester Nimitz. Of an impressive seafaring tradition of a boy born with a taste of salt water in his mouth and the spray of the sea in his eyes. That would impress you and your kind no end, but it, it wasn't like that. Yes, he's from Texas, but he was born in the landlocked town of Fredericksburg, far from the sea. He wasn't any prodigy, this toe-headed lad from the cactus country. Just an ordinary kid who played hard and stood up for what he believed in. Hey, you. Hey, kid, can you quit that hammering for a second and help me out? Sure, mister. As soon as I get this nail through. Uh, there. Hey, what's that you're hammering anyway? Uh, looks like a tent pole. This is a mask for my ship, mister. See? Ship? Oh, it's not a real ship, sir. It's my raft out on Town Creek Pond. I call it my ship. Yeah? I didn't know there was even a pond in this godforsaken spot. It's not a godforsaken spot, sir. This is the best town in Texas. Okay, okay, kid. No hard feelings. Look, I'm a stranger here, traveling salesman, and I'm looking up for a bed for the night. You know of a hotel hereabouts? What's wrong with that one there? Where? Right over there, across the street. That's my granddad's hotel. You mean to say that's a hotel? Sure, it's a hotel. Best hotel in town. Yeah, but it looks more like a... Well, uh, hey, what's that thing sticking out over the street? That's the Ford deck across in that Ford park, the Proud. <laughs> Jump in, Joseph. The Ford deck, the Proud. <laughs> Never heard of a hotel built like an ark. But my grandpa wants it to look like a ship. He planned it all himself. Ha, <laughs> ha. Well, blow me down. Hey, what's the gimmick on top? That's the captain's bridge, of course. If you knew anything about navigation, you'd know. And my okay, grandpa, okay, my gra Sonny, don't get so excited. Well, he's the smartest man in town, that's what he yeah, is. Yeah, sure. And he was a sea captain, too, for 40 years. Yeah, and yeah. And the self-esteem bubble. Yeah, okay, like okay, so I said, Sonny, take it easy. So your grandfather was a sea captain. So he could have a hotel that looked yeah, like Yeah, I know, I know. And let go of me, will you? Let go of me. Hey, 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 watch this, watch this. Hey, Jester, 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 stop it. Take your hands off that gentleman. Stop it, I say. Oh, Grammy. And he laughed at the same boat. There, 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 Chester. Never mind, son. Uh, now, sir, will you... Why, bless uh, my soul, the fellow's gone. He, he laughed at us, Grandpa. Well, buck up, Chester. Ain't the first time we've been laughed at and probably won't uh, be the last. Here, now. Uh, here, here. You'll blow your nose. Yes, Grandpa. Yeah. You know, son, you did just right to stand up that city slicker and call his bluff. Stand up for your rights every time, son. You bet, Grandpa. And always be ready to fight for the things you believe in. You're a real Nimitz, Chester, and I'm proud of you. Let's go down to the creek. Come on. Sailing, sailing over, over the mountain main. Man, you saw me wife to blow the wake of home again. Sailing, sailing over the mountain main. Many a stormy wind should blow Say, wait, come home again <laughs> uh, 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 
Hi, Arthur. Uh, uh, you know what, Grandpa? What, sister? When I grow up, I'm going to have a big ship all my own. That's right, son. Man your own ship, even if it's only a fishing dory. Uh, yeah. Only you better practice up on your swimming before you go to sea in a fishing dory. Uh, mine will be a battleship, Grandpa. All painted gray with big guns. And I'll be captain. Think I could be a captain, Grandpa? Captain? Why not an admiral? What's to stop you? This is the greatest country in the world, Chester. Only place a boy like you can get to be an admiral if he wants to. Country like that's worth serving, son. Worth fighting for. Of course you'll be an admiral. You're a Nimitz, ain't you? Homely sort of a little story, isn't it, Tokyo Rose? No swagger, no dash, no highfalutin drama. But then all I'm trying to do is to give you a true picture of what kind of a fellow... Admiral Nimitz is, where he came from, how he thinks, what his ambitions are. Oh, yes, Rosie, he does have a great ambition. Wait till I tell you about it. You'll bust your sides laughing. Yes. But everything in its proper place. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, Chester Nimitz as a boy in Texas, with his grandpa always beside him. Well, his grandpa made a further point some years later, when it was time to think of things like that. How are you going to be an admiral without spending a few years in a nap? You know, Rosie, it would tickle me pink to be able to tell you that young Nimitz was a great football hero at Annapolis. But he wasn't. No. Natchew confined himself to cheering at the football game. Natchew Nimitz, he was known as at Annapolis, and somehow that nickname stuck. Its origin long since forgotten. No, Natchew was not a college athlete. You see, his first love was the water. And so you'll find him listed in his class yearbook as stroke of his crew. God, I wish he'd only have done something in those years that would have really impressed you, Rosie. Instead, he... Well, all right, Rosie, it's... There was something that, well, that provides just a kernel of truth for those stories you sling around nightly on the airwaves of the Pacific. It was in his first year at Annapolis, in his first deep water run aboard ship. Uh, well, how do you like it, Matthew? Uh, nothing short, sir. <laughs> Where do you get that battleship you're always talking about, Matthew? <laughs> ah, that's right. My granddad always said I'd be... Admiral someday. Say, hey, this is great. Uh, this... Hey, Matthew, what's the trouble? Trouble? Oh. Oh, nothing, Ted, nothing. It's a bit rough, isn't it? Look here, Matthew, you're positively green. Why, excuse you're... Me, you're... Pat, excuse me, Patty, excuse me! <laughs> yes, the future admiral was definitely seasick. Seasick for the first and last time. That's the basis of your Nimitz seasick story, Tokyo Rose. And the man who gets most pleasure in telling it is Nimitz himself. Which perhaps explains, Rosie, why the men under him laugh so much at your clumsy propaganda effort. Well, to get on. Four years later. It was Midshipman Nimitz now, Midshipman Nimitz, with a dream in his heart, ready for his first assignment. You will report to the chief engineer. Is it a battleship, sir? Confidentially, it was not a battleship. His first command was the old Tane, and a fine ship-shaped craft he was. Other crafts, large and small, followed the Tane, and young Ensign Nimitz took every assignment with one hope always in his heart. You will report to Norfolk. This is a battleship, sir. You will report to Newport News. This is a battleship, sir. You will report to San Diego. This is sir. dream remained in his heart. For three decades it remained there. 
33 years were to elapse before he reported for duty on a battleship. In the meantime, he was to become one of the leading submarine experts of his... young submarine lieutenant that he was to meet and marry Miss Catherine Vance of Massachusetts, now mother of his three daughters and one son. It was as a young submarine lieutenant that his grandfather's admonition to practice up on your swimming was to serve him well. It was a rough sea, and the submarine skipjack was being badly tossed about. A routine drill was in progress when suddenly... Ah! Who is it? It's Grandel, the fireman, Lieutenant Nimitz. What do you think this is? The old swimming hole? Hey, where, where are you going, sir? It's Lieutenant Nimitz. He's going. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey, hey. hey, Grandel. Let me grab you. It's a fine time you picked for a bath. Next time you better use the shower. Hey. Oh, no, you don't. <coughs> Sorry, fella. That's what it says to do in all the books. Oh, hang on to my shoulder. Keep your fool head out of the water. Sorry, <laughs> Lieutenant. I, I just lost my Hang point. on, Gandel. Hang on. We've got to fight this. This current is We're drifting. Keep your head up, Gandel. <laughs> Hold on, Gandel. Hold on. They're coming. Hold on, fella. Hold on. One other thing i got to thank you for, Gandel. You're stumped. We'll both get a hot toddy out of this. Did he get the hot toddy? Well, who knows? But he did get the silver life-saving medal. And right after that, Rosie, maybe coincidentally, he started to go ahead fast. This young man from Texas, this chap with a twinkle in his eye, the quip on his tongue, the dream in his heart, the high spirits in his soul. His superiors noticed him in our simple American way. We reward men like these, Rosie. Other assignments, successive promotions, greater honors were in store for young Nimitz. Lieutenant Commander Nimitz, you will proceed to Germany and Belgium for a special duty on diesel engine construction. Commander Nimitz, special assignment with Atlantic Fleet. Duty to transport submarine forces to battle areas. Nimitz, commanding officer of submarine base at Pearl Harbor. Chief of Staff Nimitz to install training corps unit at University of California. Captain Nimitz. Rear Admiral Nimitz. Yes, that was it. Rear Admiral Nimitz, chief of the Bureau of Navigation in Washington. That was the great position he had climbed to, the tow-headed boy from Texas. And he climbed that high in the Navy because his superiors had learned that when the job was particularly tough, you automatically assigned Chester Nimitz to it. Which accounts for his coming home late one day a few years ago to his home at 2222 Q Street, Northwest, in Washington. Chester, what is it? You look pale, dear. I've got to go away, Catherine. Away? Yes, they've given me a new job. A new job? Who is they? The president. Oh, I see. Will you pack my things? Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, what will you wear, Chester? Your regular blue? No, I'm going incognito. I'll wear that old brown tweed. And Catherine. Yes, dear? Can I borrow this from you? That? Whatever for? Why, you'd look like, like an old fuddy-duddy carrying that in public. <laughs> That's exactly what I want to look like, my dear. I have some very secret documents to carry with me, and this padlock briefcase would look, well, it would look too interesting. I carry the documents in this, no one will ever suspect. And no one did suspect. For on that December day, Chester W. Nimitz, the full admiral now, started out on the biggest job of his career, carrying the secret documents in his wife's old knitting bag. Of course, it's just as well they didn't suspect. For in that old knitting bag, Nimitz carried his authorization to take over our naval command in the Pacific. He arrived in Pearl Harbor on Christmas Day, 1941, just 18 days after December 7th. Do you remember Tokyo Rose? And after he had looked his fill at the wounded hulks of proud ships and had felt the silent stares of shaken men, Admiral Nimitz said, 
I shall make no speech. I'm not very good at them. I want to say only that I have assumed a great responsibility and obligation, which I shall do my utmost to discharge. Wondering what this meant, his men gazed intently at him. I know what thoughts are in your mind. You're thinking of the cry echoing from the mainland. Where's the Navy? Where's our fleet? Well, together we'll show them in time. I'd like to say two more things. One, I have faith in you. Complete faith. And two, when I was in Hawaii before, there was a native expression we liked. Humana Wanui. That was it. Humana Wanui. It means patience. Wait. All things will be taken care of in time. And so I would counsel you, you who in your bitterness and fury would gladly go to meet the enemy in broken ships and bare hands, no matter what you think. And then suddenly, almost overnight it seemed, things began to happen. Miracles were performed. Battered docks and wharves were made whole. Ghost ships rose from the depths. Supplies came pouring in. Ships, planes, men, ammunition, food... For we here in the United States were part of this miracle. Our work, our faith, our bond helped to resurrect Pearl Harbor. And in four months, not four years, four months from the day he landed, Admiral Nimitz was ready, ready to strike the first blow, the first of a long series of blows at your men folk, Tokyo Rose. Your announcer told you the news, Rosie. Tokyo announces change in plan following Battle of Coral Sea. Japanese fleet will retire from Australian waters pending Admiral Conference with Premier Tojo. The Battle of the Coral Sea. Fifteen enemy ships destroyed, twenty damaged, threat of invasion to Australia removed. Admiral Nimitz had only one comment to make. Pearl Harbor has been only partially avenged. Nimitz had only begun. His strategic gamble at Midway paid off too, Tokyo Rose. And then, two months later, with MacArthur, Guadalcanal. Then, New Georgia. Bougainville, New Britain, Crook. The Gilbert, Marshalls, Wake. Ottawa, Saipan, the Philippines. Well, Tokyo Rose, there's the story of Chester Nimitz. His story so far. There's a big, beautiful chapter still to be written. And written it will be, though no one knows better than Nimitz himself how difficult the job is going to be. As he said, We'll stay on the job until it's finished. We'll work and fight until the last Jap lays down his rifle. On that day, and only on that day, will we know the war with Japan is over. See what I mean, Rosie? That's the ambition I mentioned before. Once upon a time, a Jap admiral boasted he'd dictate peace in the White House. But darn if the situation isn't going to be reversed. Get the point, Tokyo Rose? Well, anyway, now that you've really got some facts to work with, you can go to town on those broadcasts of yours. I hope you've enjoyed the story, Rosie. You see, we want you to know our Admiral Nimitz well, Rosie, very well. Because one of these days, you're going to meet him face to face. Thank you, Scott Cotsworth, for your fine job of narration. And you, Fred Barron, for your portrayal of Admiral Nimitz. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's our guest star and war bond salesman again, Jack Benny. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, in 48 hours, I start back for California. But I must say I've enjoyed my stay in New York. It gives you a chance to do things that you can't do out on the coast. Yesterday, for example, I rode in Mayor LaGuardia's subway. What an experience. And those nasty sinks that they're being shoved around. 
The reason I mentioned that subway ride is because of a car poster I saw there. The poster showed in the foreground a cross, a small white cross, and on it hung the helmet of an American soldier. In the background were thousands of tiny crosses and stars of David, marking the final resting places of boys that you and I once knew. Boys named Schultz and McCarthy and Goldstein and Lukowski and Romano and Smith. And the caption on that poster was short and to the point. They died together so that we may live together. Well, you and I know how true a story that car poster tells. You and I know that each month thousands of young Americans are dying because they honestly believe in a certain way of living. And they want to make sure that their children grow up to enjoy that way of living. And while no words could ever express our sorrow at the sacrifice they've made, it is also true that there are no words to express the pride we feel in them. However, if I may say so, unbounded pride in our heroes is not enough. Sorrow for those who died is not enough. If you and I are worthy of sharing the nationality of those Americans in uniform, we've got to be willing to make every possible sacrifice to help them in the grim job they've got to do. You know what I'm getting at. I ask you to buy bonds. I ask you to buy them every payday. And I ask you never to cash them in until the date of maturity. For it happens to be true, whether we like it or not, that the man who cashes in a bond before maturity is not worthy to share in the pride or the sorrow in our hero. Well, I guess that's all I've got to say. Except that next time you're in the subway or the streetcars, look at that poster. Look at it good. And remember that each cross means one life, an American life. Keep the number of those little white crosses at a minimum. Buy and hold all the bonds you can afford. Thank you. Thank you, Jack Benny. These are our men featuring today the dramatized story of Admiral Chester W. Nimitz with Jack Benny as our special guest is presented each Saturday by the Parker Watch Company and its dealers throughout America, but not to sell watches. What we ask you to buy is bonds, war bonds, more bonds. Have you sent for your copy of the beautiful combination book portfolio which the Parker Watch Company has had prepared for you? If not, do it today. Let me describe it in a few words. First, it's a wonderful booklet in brilliant colors with the pictures and biographies of all the great American war leaders being dramatized on this series of programs. And in combination with it, a portfolio for the safekeeping of your war bonds, as well as a handy chart for recording the serial numbers of your bonds. You'll be proud to own it, and you can easily. All it costs you is the mailing and wrapping cost of 10 cents. That's all. Address your request to the Parker Watch Company, Post Office Box 14, New York 19, New York. Why not do it today, right now? Write your name and address on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, and close 10 cents in coin only, and mail it to the Parker Watch Company, Post Office Box 14, New York 19, New York for your copy of our combination book portfolio entitled, These Are Our Men. <laughs> Next week, These Are Our Men will bring you the story of General Patton, and our guest star will be Miss Miriam Hopkins. So be sure to tune in, same time, same station. The music for today's program was composed and conducted by Joseph Chernyovsky, and the entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. These Are Our Men is recorded by the Office of War Information for shortwave rebroadcast to foreign countries. And don't forget now for your copy of our new combination book portfolio entitled These Are Our Men, send 10 cents in coin only to the Parker Watch Company, Post Office Box 14, New York 19, New York. This is Jack Costello speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.